producer management that's one of those topics that we can't talk about enough i mean uh, how does a producer get a manager does a producer even need a manager what does a manager do for a producer how much does a producer have to pay a manager does a producer pay a manager for all placements that they get and all income that they, that they have coming in or just the ones that the manager gets them so let's ask a producer manager all of those questions and more i had seth goldsmith on the mbc um it was a live session broadcast on beatstars.live which is something we do twice a week mondays and thursdays at 3 p.m eastern standard time on beatstars.live it's a totally free session check it out Let's be honest, you're not gonna find these videos anywhere else. Why? Uh, because I make them. So it would really help me out if you subscribe. If you've already subscribed, what also really helps is if you like the video and leave a comment. It's hard in the era of clickbait videos on YouTube and negativity in the producer community. And I appreciate your support, thank you so much. Who all is on your management roster right now? So the third guy would be DJ Afterthought. Um, who produces EDM music uh, and is working on a whole bunch of other stuff that, the, that we're working on launching. Um, so yeah, there's Ricky, Ricky P, uh, producer, engineer, artist. Um, David, who was a drummer for a long time, training to be a professional who got injured and then pivoted a few years back to uh, production full-time, which he was, he's been dabbling with for you know probably a decade. Um, and then Afterthought. Who was a touring all... DJ and sorry, my bad. No, you're good. Um, do do all of your clients live out there in LA with you, or are some of them still in the Midwest? Um, Afterthought still lives in Pittsburgh, so our our work together is completely remote. Um, but Ricky lives out here. I live with David, and um, I help Ricky run a studio called Kush Factory Studios out here. So, um. Yeah, I said that basically because he lives in the studio <laughs> out here. Okay, good, good. Because I was going to ask you about Kush Factory, and um, you know, I'm, this is as much a learning experience for me as it is for all the people tuning in. So I have a lot of questions, and some of them are um, just you know questions about what you have going on, and uh, you know, I try to draw as many connections as I can off of social media, but sometimes I need to go directly to the source, which is you. So. Um, I know uh, DJ Afterthought recently, was it DJ Afterthought who recently produced a record with Wiz Khalifa? Yeah, it's called McQueen Dreams. That was uh, DJ Afterthought and Blunts and Blondes on the production. And then, uh, yeah, we got those, those Wiz vocals cleared, which was tight. That must have been a process, right? Clearing through, um, he's with Atlantic. So Warner, you had to clear it through? Through Atlantic. Yeah. was that a was that a process or was it easy um well actually those vocals on that record were something that came out a few years back through uh like a, a an afterthought release initially and uh afterthought basically has like a really good relationship with wiz's manager will who i also uh helped manage ricky with um, so those connections, like those, like actual relationships and connections really help the process move along pretty, pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Got it. So in addition to this, this DJ Afterthought, Blunts and Blondes and Wiz Khalifa record, what are some other recent products, projects that you've been proud to have worked on? Um, so... Uh, before the, uh, before the afterthought and Wiz record, there was one with, uh, Wi-Fi's funeral, which was really cool. That was actually like, um, with another EDM producer named Hydraulics. Um, that was actually like, I started the rollout with that, like my first day on the job with DJ afterthought. So that was pretty wild to just get thrown in, into the mix. Um, and then I got David, uh, um, the pretty soon after I started managing David, I got him like, um, a sync on a, on a Reebok commercial, like the Trey Burke campaign before he got traded. Um, so that was really tight. Um, and that aired in like Madison square garden. So that's something I'm really proud of, or I mean, sorry, uh, Times square. Uh, so that was really cool. And, um, yeah, those are, those are like the highlights of, of what I've been able to do so far, I think. So let's zoom out a little bit. What is a producer manager? Um, man, uh, it's, that question is limitless. You know, it just depends on the day. Um, 
I think, uh, and, and so all of my clients have completely different goals and aspirations and different needs. Um, so it's basically, I'm in constant communication with them, figuring out what they need, what they want. Sometimes it's just day to day stuff, man. You know what I mean? It's like answering a lot of emails. Um, I know like for David specifically, it's good. So David is a producer and a great sample maker and a great sound designer. So for him, on a day-to-day basis, it's like sending samples out and getting like a healthy amount of samples in. Um, sometimes, you know, it, he's kind of like either in his production bag, like making beats or, or he's uh, in his sample making bag and there's really no in between. So it's really just my job to kind of um, keep the inspiration alive for him in a lot of ways and, and keep sounds coming in to keep him inspired, to keep cooking up. And uh, basically for, for all of my guys, it's kind of like, you know, um, keeping my ear to the ground, uh, for new talent. Uh, we're definitely always looking for songwriters to work with, um, and artists to work with that match their respective styles, uh, and other producers and other sample makers as well. You know, like I, uh, my management company was burned, birthed out of the pandemic. So it's been kind of hard to create the, the connections uh in this time so i've had to get creative on social media which is you know been great you know um this is happening because of that you know just because of my activity on social media and keeping my ear to the ground listening to people like alec friedman carl folks um you know i followed you because uh alec friedman said hey follow these guys they're kicking gems out constantly you know that was when i first started engaging with your your content on on twitter and and now we're here yeah, shout out to Adam Freeman. I think he was the guest last week. Oh, no. I didn't see that. Damn. Well, I haven't That's posted it yet on my YouTube, but I, I will. So shout out to yeah, shout out to Adam Freeman. Shout out to Carl Folks because um, they've all been guests here. Uh, and we appreciate having a, a lawyer's perspective which is, I think, something that's been missing from our space for, for a long time. And now we have two guys who are outspoken advocates for producers and they're accessible and they're consistent and they're willing to have these, these dialogues with the producer community, which is amazing. Um, I wish I had had that you know, 15 years ago. But, um, I can imagine. So... What are some daily tasks as a producer manager that that you uh, have on your agenda? Um, I mean, I'm in constant communication. Like right now, um, I'm in constant communication with kind of like all of the collaborators uh, that and and projects that we're working on. So I try to like keep the pace up. If if Afterthought is working on a record with Blunts and Blondes and um, for like, for instance, we're working with this guy for right now. Um, and his manager manager is asking me where the record's at. So I'm in constant communication between the artist manager, the producer and the collaborator. Um, I've been kind of like the liaison between afterthought and like deadbeats, uh, which is like an EDM label in Wakan and helping, um, execute the rollouts, uh, getting contracts signed. Um, seeking songwriters, seeking producers, seeking sample makers. Um, I'm kind of on my phone all day, man. I really, um, since things have shut down, I'm kind of scrolling uh, Instagram and Twitter a lot, just peeping the scene, seeing what people are doing and uh, executing things in like a timely manner. Like if I see a producer is in the studio right now, I'm going to send him David samples that we haven't sent yet, for instance. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like striking while the iron's hot on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, let me let me pick up on something you said, uh, which is that now that there's this pandemic, you are having to work a lot in in the social media world. What are some effective networking uh, techniques that you can share? Because because that's one of those things where social media is like the wild west with how people communicate with one another. And not everyone knows how to, how to network. Right. So, um, I kind of what, what, what I've learned most about, you know, my personal, I guess like brand or, or, um, 
situation on social media is, you know, like, I, for instance, like, I use everything that we have created as uh, a piece on the chess t- table, right? So like my uh, pin tweet is like the, the collabor- that the thing that David did with Reebok, right? So I'm interacting with people, indirect messages, um, you know, people can see the fact that other producers in the community follow me. Um, so I'm establishing trust already. If you DM somebody, they're going to check out what you're into, right? They're going to go to your profile. So really it's just been outreach and, um, and you know, you have to have an ear for what your artist needs. So essentially I'm reaching out to people that I think will fit, uh, the the situation that I personally have on my team. Um, And you know, the the responses are like 50, 50. It depends on who you're reaching out to. I think the best thing that anyone can do in this, uh, in this day and age is like network horizontally. I know that's, that's spoken about a lot uh, in the community, but um, if you have an ear for talent and you're, and you uh, like recognize someone else's talent and and that like your whoever you're managing or whoever you're working with is on a similar uh at a similar state in their career you never know like who's going to go up like for instance um you know I was hawking twitter like a few months back like I told you I do and I just saw this dude named Hollywood Cole uh post a, a beat video on twitter and I was like this is hard let me send this dude samples he saw that the samples were super hard. So he sent back like a pack to us like the next day, you know what I mean? So we immediately got it cracking. Uh, four months, mu- uh, four months later, I was able to link with him in LA, like, uh, on a couple of occasions, he came out here for a trip, played us some crazy music that I had no idea existed, uh, when I first reached out to him. And now he helped produce the, uh, Wayne and Drake record, uh, that just came out. So, Forming a connection with talent uh, is like the biggest lesson that I've learned in 2020, Um, like not based on accolades, you know what I mean? Because if the talent is there and you form a genuine connection with people, you have no idea like the the possibilities. Um, So I know that that's an important point because most people want to network vertically, you know, they want to they want to work with the person that they feel is higher up than them and they ignore all the people around them so so horizontal networking is something that i think gets overlooked quite a bit absolutely absolutely i agree and it's hard you know when you're when you're here and there's someone else here it's hard to reach them so it's almost <laughs> I, I i don't discourage it necessarily but like you, I encourage horizontal networking because it's a lot easier to access the people who surround you than it is for the people who are probably busier than you, probably who don't even manage their <clears throat> own social media and so forth. So, For sure. I there needs that's... to be an equal value exchange. You know what I mean? Like both parties have to feel like they're getting the same out of the situation. Um yeah, it's like a natural human response that if someone needs something, you're just kind of like, ah, eh, regardless of where you're at or, or what you're dealing with, like music or not, you know. This is a really good question. So this is interactive today. So we're going to have some questions uh, coming in. And this is probably the best one I've seen so far. So let me post that. Do you want to respond? <laughs> Damn, that's crazy, man. I, honestly, I feel like I'm the best looking one out of the bunch. You really, but... <laughs> I think that's an honest answer. I think that adds a lot of value to the community. Um, here, here's another question that's really contentious. Uh, and I've heard basically two main schools of thought on this. Uh, when does a producer need a manager? And should a producer actively be looking for a manager? Um, to be honest with you, uh, I, I don't know if I'm the, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask that question because I feel like I took on, um, You know, Afterthought and Ricky kind of have, like, they have, like, their solo careers that I'm trying to help build. So I'm kind of, like, reacting to all of their needs uh, as a manager. But with David, like, you know, we're we're, we're in the middle of trying to get him on right now. Like, like his talent is undeniable. And, like, every time we've been able to link with someone, it's been a go. You know what I'm saying? So, um, 
but I live, but that situation was very specific. Like I lived with David for over a year and I saw his process and I saw his growth. Um, and so I was willing to kind of help build with him from the ground up. I wouldn't do that with a lot of people, you know? So I feel like it's advantageous to have a manager at any point if they're willing to break their back for you before you're on or before you need something to manage quote unquote, you know, but I just saw the people that David was working with and what they were doing and they believed in him and he's adding value to all these studio sessions. And I'm like, let's get it. Like I feel blessed that I got introduced to him in the way that I did as a manager. And I, I feel like he would agree vice versa, like because of uh, what ended up happening with me, you know, we just kind of, that was like a perfect storm. But I would say, you know, like I, I wouldn't have managed him if his talent wasn't there. You know what I mean? I feel like you have to have, like, uh, you, you, you have had to put the reps in for years beforehand, um, and kind of have something going for yourself before you need a manager for sure. So I hear a lot of producers, I hear artists saying this to a recording artist, um, but I hear a lot of producers, especially saying, uh, all I need is a manager to take me to the next level. I'm sure you've heard that as well. H how do you feel about that statement? uh it's uh it's nonsense that's nonsense <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't know I, I i mean for some people i guess it could be true like if you're completely like if your music is like if you're cooking up masterpieces and symphonies and your and your and your business sense is absolute garbage like that might be the case but you would have to be like one in a million you know what i mean uh, like uh i think that's just people that are unwilling to learn um the processes of what it takes to to make it in this community especially right now man with with resources with like what you're doing like the bro you're a perfect example of this is like i don't even know how you have time to make music with all the things that you're involved in like this and and how you've taught yourself to market etc cetera, etc cetera. so <laughs> no, like, I, look you're gonna make me cry because it's true let's I'll, I'll shut up can you hear me yeah yeah okay but Oh yeah, I was just saying like, man, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, that's just someone who's not willing to put the work in, I think, you know. Um, you have to be willing to teach yourself things to get to the point where you don't need to do it yourself anymore or not, you know what I mean? Like, um, like you're doing a great job, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think I need a, a clone, honestly. Um, like, do you, have, I, do you have a manager? Uh, I have I have managers for certain aspects of my career, but not like a day to day kind of manager. Not someone that's necessarily not, not the kind of manager that you would be to um, to your cousin. I'll, I'll put it that way. Right, and I'm definitely day to day for all my guys. You know what I yeah. mean? Which uh, so I'm extremely accessible. <laughs> Oh, th this sounds like a conversation we should have uh, outside of this. But uh, what was I going to say? So, so some criteria that um, you mentioned for when you want to take on a new client. Obviously, talent is one, and you said um, having a good understanding of the business is another. Um, so, all all of the people that I manage, I've known for like ten years plus. So, um, you know your quality and your the quality of the person and the character of the person is, is a is a huge thing for me um if i wasn't managing anyone at this point i, I would have a completely different answer but at this point like if, if i was looking to take on another client it would have to fit in um to, to what i'm doing right now you know like like all like my other clients would have to benefit from what said new artist was bringing to the table you know what i mean and they would have to benefit from what my artists are currently doing, you know? Here's a good question that relates to that. Um, the, Sanders 1992 wants to know what percentage a manager usually takes and whether this percentage comes out of the advance or the royalties, or I guess both. Right. Um, well, we're still waiting for things to come in. The, the music business payments are, are super, uh, it, it takes like a long time to get everything sorted. My management company is like only six months old, you know what I mean? And we've only had a certain amount of re releases within that. So I haven't really crossed that bridge yet, but 
Um, I think it, it, it's different. It's situational. Um, you know, right now it's kind of like, I don't even have a contract with my guys right now. Like we're just, you know, if, if I can't get paid from my people for the work that I'm doing, like, I don't want to be in business with them anyways. So whenever that, whenever we need to cross that bridge, we're going to cross that bridge. I've had like some pre preliminary conversations with people and, um, you know, there's definitely like this universal, like you, you're going to get 20% of whatever you bring in. You know what I mean? So if you create an opportunity, I'm going to take 20%, 20%, you know what I mean? But that's, that's as far as I've gotten with that. Yeah. So how do you feel about the, the uh, arrangements that are out there? Cause there are so many different arrangements uh, with regards to management. And I've, I've seen increasingly more managers, uh, actually, let me save this one question because because there's a tweet that that uh, you responded to that that I want to connect to this topic. But um, as far as a manager taking on the day to day role, so so Dame Ritter is is my partner in Music Entrepreneur Club, and he often right. talks about how a manager's work can often bring in opportunities that are indirect. And so, therefore, he's he he tends to lean more towards twenty percent flat of an artist's uh, income. Dame does, yeah. And you know, right. I was always resistant to that um, as a as an artist being managed, but understanding that in some cases, if a manager helps with branding and helps with just creating all of these opportunities that aren't necessarily uh you know the direct result of something they did but sort of the result of all of their work over time is that something that that has crossed your mind as as far as when you get to that point where you're putting things in writing yeah i i think it's fair based on the i think that's fair based on on the situation right so um, I've kind of been managing David from the beginning, but he's also super like he's, he, 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 we've learned the business together. We, we consume the same content. We're working really hard every day together to understand this and move forward. Um, so in all of my situations, I don't know if I would be comfortable taking 20% just because of how much David is doing by himself. And for instance, like DJ Afterthought and Ricky P were already established by the time that I, uh, started managing them you know what i mean ricky p is a platinum producer he's five times uh grammy nominated recording engineer these guys took a chance on me because they knew my work ethic in my heart you know what i'm saying so i don't feel entitled to 20 percent of any of my guys uh just to be transparent like like a flat 20 percent you know like uh, i feel like definitely 20 percent of anything that i would bring in and then maybe figure out like a a smaller percentage if i continue to do the day-to-day -day, but at some point I would like to bring someone else on to handle kind of the day to day stuff that I've been doing so I can focus on like the, the bigger business and expanding the company. So let me pick up on something you said about you and David um, consuming the same resources. So you're talking about basically putting yourself through a, a music business crash course and kind of um, what do they say? Working, working on your feet or, or flying by the seat of your pants or whatever that, idiom is uh what what are some of the ways that you've uh enhanced your understanding of the music business and and what are some of the resources that you and david consume to to become um the the, the music business entities that you have become sure um so i started out by reading like what people consider to be uh the music business bible which is just like the um everything you need to know about the music business right so also, I started consuming all of this content probably a year prior to uh, becoming anyone's manager. I just knew I wanted to enter uh, the business in some way or another. So I took a year basically and educated myself. Um, some other great resources are like the Song Trust webinars, um, your channel, you know what I mean? Listening to people like Illmind. Um, the Producer Grind podcast is crazy. Uh, Dan Runke or Runcy, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he has oh, yeah, like... Oh, Dan, uh, Dan Runcy, yep, Trapital. Yep, exactly, Trapital. Figuring out all of the good... There's like really, really good um, email lists to be subscribed to, you know what I mean? Um, that one, there's like Water and Music, uh, and 
uh, Carl folks, you know what I mean? Um, so publishing and, and like the music business side for me is like, it's kind of like, uh, learning a language or something is like, I need to be constantly reminding myself how these things work to, to keep my understanding up to date and things are changing fast now. So, um, just consuming as much as possible. Like, I don't know if you know who human resources is like the dis- distribution company out here. They had panels with like all of the craziest people in the music business for like four or five consecutive weeks when things first shut down. So the resources are out there. You just have to be curious. Um, you just have to be curious. What are some uh, common mistakes you see producers make in the music business? Um, taking a pub deal too early. I think every, like a lot of the, uh, producers I've come in contact with in person out here, all like all kind of have like a nightmare deal that they were a part of. They signed something and all of a sudden they're getting put into country sessions or, you know what I mean? Like the resources are allocated misproperly or the person who signed them, uh, moved to a new company, uh, and like, they can't even get in contact with their, (laughs) <laughs> publishing company anymore um so that's a huge one is like make sure you're signing the right publishing deal and that you're in business with the right people from the get-go um yeah what what's the the danger of signing the wrong publishing deal i mean how does that affect a producer's career long term um i mean you can essentially um I mean, I mean, that, that, that's like, honestly, and, and, you know, if, if you sign the wrong publishing deal, you could be locked in for life. There's people, there's people fighting right now. I won't name any names, but there's people that like, like established producers that have been locked into the same publishing agreement for like 14 years. I mean, we all just saw what happened with Kanye, you know what I mean? Like, uh, so yeah, I would just make sure that you have, have a lawyer, you know what I'm saying? Um, your whole career can be determined by a, by a bad pub deal, uh, essentially. I know a lot of producers that are still trying to get out of theirs and finding like creative ways to, to figure out how to get out of it, you know? So you don't, that's not something you want to be focused on. You want to be focused on moving forward and yeah. And winning rather than like, how can I get out of this situation? Um, yeah. Do, do all of your clients use the same lawyer or do they all have their own respective lawyers? No, they all have their own respective lawyers. Um, yeah, David, actually, David, just, uh, David's lawyer is Carl folks uh, right mm-hmm. now. And, um, and Ricky, Ricky's got his own lawyer. Um, and afterthought has his own lawyer. Yeah. And they're happy with, with their, with their lawyers. Yeah. 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 As far as I know, I think, I think Ricky has access to a few and, um, yeah, we, we haven't had any issues with it, with Afterthought's lawyer for as long as I've been, uh, managing him. Yeah. I know that can, that can cause some trouble too. There are a lot of, it's like everywhere you turn in, in the music business, there's a potential pitfall. So it's always, you know, difficult to, uh, to, to, to know and anticipate those pitfalls. You know, a lot of it is learning by, by making mistakes and trial and error. But sometimes, like you said, signing the, the wrong publishing deal early on is a mistake that you learn from, but then you're also locked into it. So it, it's, it's hard. How do, how do you minimize the chance of, of making mistakes that serious aside from getting a lawyer i think educating yourself um is is the only answer you know that and um i know everyone has like a different situation financially and you know a different home life and a different upbringing and and um but it's it's like the 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 less I know this is discussed uh, a ton, but like the less you're dependent on that, on that upfront bag, like the better chances you have of, of signing a, a good deal, you know, and not being blinded by um, your first couple thousand or 10,000 or $20,000 that's offered to you. But I think educating yourself and make sure you're signing the right pub deal for your situation. You know, like a lot of people, I feel like sign a sign a publishing deal and then have like a minimum requirement that they can't, 
fulfill. You know what I mean? Because they had like one hit or something and their and their talent or or like it just they just can't follow up, you know, so then they're locked in a situation. Um where like probably an admin deal would have been smarter, <laughs> you know. Uh, and building and, your catalog. Like a lot of the producers that, that I'm dealing with right now are unpublished and, and kind of like these publishing companies are, it's not like a bidding war, but they're all creating opportunities for their, for these guys. So there's like these different publishing companies that are essentially like foaming at the mouth to give these guys opportunities. And when one lands, then it's like, okay, let's talk business. Let's see if we can figure out a deal. So, so if you're building your catalog, um, you're just building leverage essentially. Um, yeah, it's been wild to see like, uh, a couple, a couple close friends, uh, have opportunities like that. Like publishing companies are offering these guys opportunities before they've signed them. You know what I mean? To try to sign them. So, okay. Like a trial period. I don't even know if, if it's that. Test. It's just, yeah, it's like they see the talent, they see the records that these guys have produced, and they know that it, it that, that they could come. That essentially, they, they, they they're going to be profitable, so they try to uh, land a, a big record with them before a, a different publishing company. So then they have, so then they can essentially sign them. And um, if you get an opportunity like that and you land it as a producer, from what I understand so far, it's like you want to sign that deal because then you might get get like blackballed <laughs> essentially if you don't oh right because they're kind of giving you a gift and yeah. the expectation is once you get that gift you're obligated to sign with them but you know i guess why wouldn't you that gives you one more reason to sign to to a deal if they've already given you an opportunity um Exactly. And in some of these cases, you know, these companies are, are, are fighting to get this placement for months. So it's like they put months or a year uh, of work into trying to get you an opportunity. And if you land it, then it's like, you know, and then, but, and if you deny that, then another company might catch wind of that. They, you did that to that company. So all of a sudden we're not going to start, we're not going to be providing these opportunities for you either. You know what I mean? So. Damn, that sounds like a really tough situation to be in. Damn. Um, I mean, also a really cool, it's like you're, you're in a position of leverage, but then you're also in a position of obligation at the same time. It's kind of weird. It is weird. That is weird. Well, thank it's God stressful. no one's phoned me at the mouth to sign me to a publishing deal. I'm not in that <laughs> position. <laughs> I doubt that's true. I doubt that's true. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of publishing companies will be interested in signing you, man. Oh, this is, this is a good time to plug um, Beatstars Publishing because they're, um, offering uh, publishing administration through Sony ATV. And from what I've been told to people who have had Sony ATV admin deals before the BeatStars Publishing uh, partnership, they're they're happy with, with those deals. So um, that's something that all BeatStars users have access to. Uh, Atray713 asks, do I need a manager? He's been making beats for seven years and he wants to know if a manager can help him develop the sound and the marketing. Are those things that managers tend to do or is that something else that he's that he's seeking? Um, I think depending, uh, different managers have different strengths. Um, and so I think that, that depends on your manager. I think uh, developing your sound, if, if, if a manager is that in, you know, as a producer, I don't know, because a producer is the one who's like a, a producer in the, in the, like in, in a, in a certain sense of the word is a sound developer. You know what I mean? Like, um, so that's not what I do. I, I, I'm not helping develop a sound. Um, and I'm not, I'm my strength, my strength isn't marketing. So I know enough to be able to ask the right questions and kind of like run certain ad campaigns and stuff like that. But, um, I'm sure there are managers out there. They're like a uh, great managers are uh, I've seen um, like digital marketers become some of the, like the craziest managers in, in, in this current day and age. Um, yeah. So I think you'd be lucky if, if, if a manager who is a digital marketer would want to work with you right now, because yeah, that, that's a, that's a super, that's a superpower in this day and age. What's the hardest part of managing producers? 
Um, waiting for a, a potential record to come out, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's like we, you know, you send out a hundred songs, you get 10 back, one might come out essentially, you know, so you, so it's like a constant waiting game. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the hardest thing. And that's why like, uh, you know, for instance, David is working on um, creating like a a sample business, m- making drum loops. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and and uh, creating a business that um, uh, placements would be a product of. So we're not trying to be dependent on releases coming out. I think that's a really difficult game to play um, as a producer um in the current landscape so i would say yeah i don't know that and and being accessible you know all the time managing three people um is a who all have different needs is a is a difficult thing for for a manager for me you know um so it's kind of like protecting my energy so then i can give forth the best energy is is like the main thing that i've had to balance yeah, I mean, so so, what are some ways to generate funds in between these records? Because they, they they're far and few between, and like you said, it, playing the waiting game also means waiting on on money. So, how are some ways that that you're seeing producers fill in those gaps, staying busy, continuing to to generate an income for themselves? Right. Well, it depends on your skill set. You know, like. Um for Ricky, he's got a studio, which is incredible, an incredible source of income. And, uh, you know, for Afterthought, Afterthought has a studio in Pittsburgh that he runs and operates. Um, and sync placements uh, will be great, you know. it's a, So I've been basically researching, like, uh, music supervisors, getting in touch with people and, and getting sync placements. Those are the in-betweens that, that we've seen right now. It's, def- it's difficult. It's not, that's not an easy thing. It's like, how do I make money uh, out of thin air, you know? Um, but that that's what we've done so far and, and, and selling beats to, you know, to artists on the come up, you know what I'm saying? That's a, that's another way. Yeah. What was it, what was it like getting that, that sync deal? Um, I know someone asked earlier how, how that even came about. Um, so the, so the sync deals I've been able to secure so far was by just, uh, like, I've been involved in music for 10 years, you know, so I've, so I've had my network before I became a manager. And one of the first things I did was just reach out to everyone that I ever knew that I had like a a semi real relationship with and let people know what I was doing. And uh, the Reebok deal just came because one of my, one of my close friends runs a creative agency, you know what I mean? So he's basically throwing us these opportunities before he's giving them to other people. Um, But I think the best way the the other lines of communication I've been able to open is, um, you know, these music supervisors are accessible. They're not like, uh, they're, they're a portion of the business that are, they're, these are just regular people, you know, there's less ego involved and there's less like, a, so I feel like they, they appreciate being appreciated. So everything that I've done uh, in securing like a relationship with the su- uh, music supervisor is I've looked up, I've looked them up on IMDb. I've seen if they've done interviews, I learned about them and then I reached out to them directly. So I got in touch with um, Rudy Chung, who is like the music supervisor on the last dance because I read uh, an interview that he did last year. And I said, Hey man, I see a lot of you and me, this, this, and this was cool that what you did. And he reached right back to me and said, Hey man, that's awesome. Appreciate it. Feel free to send streaming links, you know? Um, yeah, it's just form. It's just being a genuine person and, and, and learning and, and reaching out. Uh, Bufo has a suggestion. Does this work? Have you ever seen this? <laughs> That's actually a great idea. <laughs> I don't see why not. Everyone has to eat. Uh, switching topics. Uh, I want to switch to the topic of ownership. Big topic. There are a lot of people in the music business who debate whether or not the producer of a beat owns any part of the song created from that beat. Is this a mentality that you encounter in the business? 
I haven't encountered it yet. I mean, I, 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 I crossed that bridge when I was an artist, um, a few times, you know, just like, uh, and that was back when I didn't really know what was going on. And, and that was just being uneducated. So I think that that's, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've been seeing the stuff that you, uh, the, the engagements that you've been having recently. And, um, sorry, I can't, <laughs> you're good. I, I, I guess I understand both sides of it, but it's just like, both people are involved in creating it. But, and if, if I, I, I think that, if each party has a full understanding of the business and they both want their ownership of the song, then both people should have ownership of the song. If the producer wants ownership of the song, you should give producer ownership of the song. That's it. You know what I mean? And I understand the argument. Like, I guess like you could, if I'm an artist and I'm dealing with a producer and I'm investing $10,000 into marketing, I guess it, it could be fair in, in a certain world to be like, hey man, I'm putting up all this bread for for the release. Like, would you mind if we recoup some of this before we paid you out? Like maybe that would be a discussion, but that's as far as uh, I think that discussion goes for me. Like that's negotiable at that point. Yeah, I, I think recoupment is totally reasonable, but I, I rarely see that happening. But I think that's also kind of one of those higher level uh, concerns. That's not something that the average person understands or even realizes is, a, is an option in one of these arrangements. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's how the majors do it. Yeah, yeah. So other than that, I think it's just an argument. Most times it's just like two uneducated people trying to make a business deal in the music industry, you know, it's like pe people want that, but don't know why they want it. Or like, uh, you know what I mean? They just think it's like any other transaction and it's not. So. Yeah. So how do we, how do we change that, that dialogue? How do we change the, the nature of these conversations and, and shift the, the paradigm a little towards education, towards seeking information and, and, and towards uh, reaching fair and, and mutually beneficial agreements. I think creating content like this, man, to be real with you, you know, it's like, it's the social media age. It's the era of information. And I think that the more people communicate in general, uh, the better, you know, because for a long time, and I think it was, it was built like that is like, you know, the, the, the information and the education was coming from the top down. The labels had all of the information and the education and they kind of like purposefully held it back from people. But because of uh, social media and because of platforms like this, we've been able to talk with one another and share experiences. And um, I think that's super powerful and we just have to keep pushing forward um, in that way. And just communicating, man, you know, clubhouse has done incredible things. I've heard huge, I've heard like man, manager conversations up there of guys that are managing like the top producers and top artists that are still learning from each other. You know what I mean? Like openly on a platform where a thousand people can hear what they're saying. So not only are these people that are already at the level that like where they're making serious money learning from one another, but they're at the same time teaching a thousand people that are, that are tuning in, you know? So I think it's, it's headed in a, in a, in a good direction as long as people have an open mind, essentially. So speaking of ownership, um, Carl folks who manages one of your clients, uh, uh doesn't manage, doesn't manage, uh, or sorry, sorry, that, that represents <laughs> one of your clients as a, yeah, yeah, as an attorney. Um, and he also, repre he also represents Othello beats who was a, a guest here. Um, he, he recently tweeted good managers deserve equity, not commission. So this is what I was, wanting to bring up earlier when we were talking about you and, and your 20% and, and um, how you structure your deals with your clients. I know you retweeted that, so I figured you have some thoughts on it. What does that mean to you to have equity and rather than a commission as a manager? Yeah, so I retweeted that and basically said, go, I retweeted, I like quote tweeted it and said goals. So that for me is like the best possible case scenario um, because that would mean that you're a good manager. So you're deserving of that equity. So everyone is winning at the highest possible level in that relationship. 
Um, you know, I think obviously in, in the, in the, that tweet or that mindset in the wrong hands could be, uh, not, uh, not a good thing. You know what I mean? But so when I retweeted that and said goals, um, that would mean holding yourself accountable as a manager and being the best manager that you can be as well. Got it. Uh, back to Twitter. So, so in October, Adam Friedman, who we talked about earlier, the lawyer who represents a lot of producers, he tweeted about how a and at major labels didn't know who to talk to within the, the label system about paying producers their royalties. Um, and he said, I don't even blame them. I blame the systems. And you replied that producers are really out here getting at the worst. How are producers getting at the worst and, and what needs to, to change with these systems? Well, I was responding to that because that was a specific, um, I think that was about UMG. Yeah. I know Adam mentioned it was two weeks ago when he was on here. He mentioned having particular difficulties with the UMG royalty system. Yeah. So, uh, that, that response to that tweet in particular was, uh, part of my experience from managing the Kush factory actually, or helping uh, run the Kush factory. Like I process and, um, all the invoices that we do. And UMG is one of our, one of our bigger clients. And, uh, I, I was responding to that because it seems like the Kush factory is getting paid out faster than a lot of producers are, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, they're essentially treating a business entity with more respect, uh, than people. So speaking of Kush Factories, you and, and Ricky P partner on Kush Factory, correct? Or is it his no. and you just manage it? It's it's uh he it's his uh he's a co owner with uh with someone else, like a silent investor essentially. And um, you know, basically part of my uh roles as a manager has been taking on certain responsibilities at the Kush Factory. Um that's just yeah. So I, uh, you know, I run some sessions there still as an engineer, um, sometimes very, uh, infre infrequently, but sometimes I'm studio managing there and, um, handling the, the money with our corporate clients. So Ricky P has, I believe I checked his social media. He posted at least a picture of a diamond plaque for the Wiz Khalifa song. See you again, which was obviously a huge record. Um, I think it was only topped in commercial performance by Old Town Road or something. You know, we're talking about phenomenally successful records. Yeah, once in a lifetime. Once in yeah, a lifetime. what what was his role in that record? Um, so he uh, recorded with and helped produce on that. Like, uh, you know, just giving, you know, uh, like feedback as a creative feedback as an engineer and a producer, yeah. And did that happen prior to you taking him on as a client oh yeah yep absolutely okay. i mean yeah that's <laughs> how, how that's does insane, a diamond <laughs> well yeah but how does how does a diamond record help a producer how did it transform his career because you obviously knew him at that time yeah yep um man ricky i mean uh, I, I didn't know him as well as I know him now, but man, he was going up like, and you know, around, around that time, Ricky was, was, was living his best life. Uh, that's all I can tell you, you know, what I mean? <laughs> for sure. And on top of that, like, you know, he had just produced, um, uh, man, the, the whiz and, uh, when I'm in there, like pedal to the flow, man, uh, pull up, pull up with whiz and Uzi and, yeah, it was a, that was a really good time for Rick. But, I, you know, essentially what I can tell you is that records like that, um, you know, it helped him be able to open up a studio in 2020 and dominate from day one. You know what I mean? Like there's like three number one records coming out of there uh, this year. Uh, and it just opened up in February and just in time for a pandemic. You know what I mean? So the the brand of, of Ricky P, um, not only as a producer, but uh, but in an incredible engineer is, is super powerful is super, super powerful. I've seen that firsthand, you know? Okay. So to pick up on that, from your perspective, having witnessed all of this, what makes Ricky P such an effective producer in, in making the right records? I think actually, making, 
Sorry. Because these are, these are hit, they're, you know, we're not looking at them and saying, wow, these are good songs. These are effective songs in the sense that they're communicating something to, to the masses to the point that they're going diamond. I mean, that's 10 million sales. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, I think uh, Ricky is just brutally honest. That's, that's the number one thing. With that being said, though, his energy is magnetic and he's incredible at making people feel comfortable. Um, on top of that, his technical sk skills as a recording engineer are incredible. I, I know that from firsthand experience. Every time I've done a record with Ricky, he's gotten the best out of me. I, it's, it's not something that you can put a finger on, you know, it's just that he gets the best out of people. And that's uh, incredible moving forward with his, with his solo career, you know, he has access and friendships with all, with all of these incredible artists that come through the Kush factory. Um, and, you know, he's essentially producing records and features that he's uh, getting on his own songs um, that we're about to release moving forward. And it's like, you know, all these guys who have their best verses on Ricky P songs, man, it's just a fact. Like he just brings it out of people. I don't know if it's the time of day or, you know, he just, he just knows what he's doing, man. The guy is, is, is magic for sure. Well, is he, is he self-taught or does he have uh, formal training as an engineer? I think he's completely self-taught, you know, he's been in a, um, in a, in a ton of sessions out here with like, you know, young Berg is someone that he brings up constantly that he's learned from. Um, so he's definitely had like mentors, but he's never been to a school or anything like that. He just, you know, he came out to LA with no money and just got it cracking, you know, essentially Ricky's really self-made. So let me ask you one last question. It's another tweet from Adam Friedman, and, and he recently tweeted something else that you retweeted, which was, producers, do you ever try to get your own press for when you have a big placement coming out? Have you even thought about it? What should producers do to maximize and build on their own accomplishments? Um, I think they should be doing what artists are doing, you know, um, uh, which is essentially... You know, if you believe in a record and you think it's going to help take your career to the next level, look into how much a marketing campaign costs. You know what I mean? See, if you have, you know, PR is like kind of expensive uh, in, in a lot of cases, but if you have any connections, just move around, try to take interviews, you know, do anything, make yourself accessible, get your face out there and, uh, you know, be the artist that you are. The thing is that this whole time, like the, the, the public, I think the, the thing for producers in this current stage is like, you don't have to be a superstar or try to be like the main artist or whatever, but it's like, put yourself out there because the industry is going to get to know you. And I think that'll create incredible opportunities for you. Um, the more accessible you are, the more, you know, people building trust in the community, I think is a super powerful thing. Um, and, you know, doing things like this uh, is something that builds that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on here and talk for real.